Pastor, thank you for doing that, man. I, I feel like I can hear now. It's kind of like a, you pull out this big Q-tip and you just get all the wax out your ear. Some of you are going, Pastor, that's a little too graphic for me. It's all right, man. We get real. Y'all have wax in your ear, and when you wake up, you need to brush your teeth because your breath stinks. Come on, somebody. We're all real, amen? It is what it is. I want to deal with something today. Actually, last week we talked about the resurrection, and we said without the resurrection, we're not... Really, that's really the foundation of our Christianity. Christ said He would, and He did. He rose again. But one of the things that really that we need to stand on today, and I think sometimes for the most part, it wavers, and even to the point where we just, we lose it. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, you know, the older you get, the, the more often you forget things. Amen? Some of the older folks go, oh, yeah, well, I know, I, I get that. Listen, if I had money for every time I lost my keys, I'd be a really rich guy. Amen? My wife's like a tracking device. She can just find them. Boom. There they are. <laughs> but we lose things. And really, they're still there. We just don't know where they're at. You know? You ever heard somebody say, you know, it was at the last place I looked? Well, good, because if you found it and you keep looking, there's a problem with you. Amen? But sometimes things happen in our lives and we really lose faith. We're saved. We love Jesus. We just have a hard time believing that we can get through a situation or a problem or a circumstance or whatever it may be. Well, guess what? You're not alone. That's been happening before time, man. Listen, that's been happening long before you showed up. Disciples had to deal with it. And so we're going to go there this morning. We're talking about finding faith. Now, I was thinking about this, and, and I'm not going to develop all this part of it, but I thought it was kind of interesting how even Mary and Joseph misplaced faith. Come on. Jesus was faith. Jesus was love. Jesus was everything. He was 12 years old. Things were going along. They just jumped in the family and got in the wagon and moved down the hall and got out the door and ran through the desert for three days and finally says, where's Jesus? Come on. They had to go back and find him. He was in the temple doing his job. And here's really the, the reason I said that is many times we just got to go back. Sometimes we just got to take a step back. You know, sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. We get ahead of our emotionally dysfunction. We got to kind of go back and say, okay, this is where I found it. This is where it's stable. I'm going to pick it up here and, and move on with it. Now, we find the disciples here, and they're warning. They're really warning some things here. One of the things they're warning is, is Jesus is teaching them that, you know, <clears throat> you got to overcome offenses. He says here, he says, when he, said, when he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offense should come, but woe to him who through whom they do come. <clears throat> In other words, offenses will happen. He says it's impossible they won't happen. And really, that's a great lesson for us to learn because all of us at some level have been offended. And when we get offended for whatever reason, our faith really gets smaller. Because it really damages our faith. But he's saying here, offenses will come. And he said, it's better for them if a milestone, a millstone were hung around their neck. And he wore, well, I'll tell you what, I'm just crossed up. And he would throw them into the sea. Then that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, when he's talking about little ones here, you know, he's talking about children also, but also new believers. Yeah. Come on, little believers. Because, you see, sometimes we can get so boisterous and so zealous in our faith that a new believer comes along and we can say something really horrible and just throw them a curve and 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 they never recover you know that's why my heart breaks many times when you see these you know big ministries and and by the grace of god it could be any one of us but these big ministries when they fall because a lot of new believers never recover from it come on it says take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you rebuke him and if he repents forgive him and if he sins against you seven times in a day, seven times in a day return to you saying, I repent, you should forgive him. Now, this is a great lesson, amen? Yeah, amen? Because it doesn't matter how many times you get offended, you should say, I forgive you. Now, of course, you know, you use your brain, and, and, and if they say, I'm going to be there, and you get offended because they don't show up, then pretty soon you just don't wait on them, amen? amen. Don't get offended by it. Matter of fact, I, I remember one time I, I had a book, and uh, um, uh, John Bevere wrote a book about... Um, bait of offense. 
the bait of offense. And bait of, yeah, bait of, bait and Satan, that's right. And it's about offenses. And I had, I was fortunate to have breakfast with him. And I, I looked at him and I said, man, I said, I loaned my book out to somebody. They didn't bring it back and I got offended. And so he's like, you need to read it again. Amen. <clears throat> so it says, so the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea. And it would obey you. Okay? Now, what did he say there when he talks about the apostles to the Lord? Let's jump back up to verse 5. And the apostles said to the Lord, do what? Increase our faith. Now, these are guys who've seen a lot of miracles. These are guys who, you know, witnessed him walking on the water. These are guys who've seen him feed thousands of people with a couple of a bologna sandwich. Come on, somebody. This is a guy who's seen all these things, and yet they're looking at him, and he's talking about the offenses and things, and he says, increase our faith. Increase our faith. And he goes and talk about the mustard seed. Now, again, we jump over to Mark, and it's another place in Mark 9 where Jesus overhears them. He says, what are you discussing with them? He overhears them in verse uh, 16. And he goes on to say, he's talking to the disciples, and one of the things he says here, one of the guys brings in a sick baby, a sick boy to him, and the boy has seizures and has all these problems, and he discusses them with him. He tells him all this stuff. And basically what the father says is, we brought this to the disciples, and they prayed, but nothing happened. And so Jesus comes into the picture, and he takes over, and he's asking about all the questions and stuff. And he speaks to the demon or whatever it was that was haunting this young man and casts him out. But later on, the disciples pulled Jesus aside and said, why can't we do that? How can we do that? And Jesus replies to them. He says, you know, some things just takes faster than praying. Now, there's some things I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to grab the horns of the altar and not let go. There are some things that just don't come easy. Sometimes we, we, we live life and things just start happening for us easy. And when something really kind of gives us a hard time, we just give up. But sometimes things take faster than prayer. I don't know if you've ever fasted and pray. I will tell you this. You will be challenged. You will be challenged. Matter of fact, I, I cringe every time I think that the Lord speaks to me about the church going into a fast. And we've done it many times in the past. Because every time we, we fast, man, some ugly something raises this ugly head. You know, last week, Judy and I were fasting. You know, certain things raise his ugly head. You know? And so you've got to prepare for those things. But he says here, he talks about, you know, really help us. And so he says some of these things really comes out only by, you know, fasting and praying. Now... One of the things we must understand, we have the scriptures, and one of the things the scripture find, we find in the scriptures, faith comes by hearing, right? Yeah. Now, Romans 10, 15, it says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as Isaiah says, Look, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, we, we hear and we listen to the word of God and we get faith from that. But we also get faith from other people who've gone through difficulties and they share what they went through. And somebody else could be going through the same thing. And they're really easy to relate because they know exactly where they're at. And so when they share with them what God done for them, listen, their faith gets boosted a little couple of notches up a little bit. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes we just need to mix our faith together to get through some of these situations. And it comes by here. I mean, if somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I'm struggling in this area of my life, and I know that something maybe that I took place in my life that I got through, man, I'll share it with them. You know, and I'll encourage them how God got me through it to the other side of it. Because if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Amen? Now, the other thing is I want you to understand what faith is. And many of you know the definition. It's found over in Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things, what, not seen. And then he goes on to say, for by it the elders obtain a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were formed or framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Now this is a great book here. If you want to read something about faith, go back and read this chapter, Hebrews 11. Because it goes through all these guys and they're really the patriarchs, the saints of the scriptures, and they're really giving their testimony on what faith did, you know, everyone from Moses all the way down the line. And so this is the same thing we must do. Now, one of the things that we get caught up in, and we need to really be careful with this, is we say, I don't believe it unless I see it. Now, the scripture says, that talks about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were like that. Well, we don't believe it unless we see it. Now, you know why they were called Sadducees? Because they were Sadducees. But anyway... 
That's an old one. I just kind of, you know, one of those times you just kind of get gripped and you say, well, you just got to let it go. Some of these young people never heard it before. And you hope you get a few laughs, but you don't. They were sad, you see. Anyway, we have to be careful that we don't get like that. I don't want to be sad, you see. <laughs> I don't want to get caught up in the fact that if I don't see it, I don't believe it. Because faith is a substance not seen, but hoped for. Now, I spoke with some of you this morning, and I believe that you have a brain. Don't see it, <laughs> but I know what's in there. I mean, I didn't pull out my pocket knife, so let me just take off a year and nobody will notice. Let me just kind of look inside there and see. No, I didn't do that. We believe it's in there, and so we have to trust. Amen? Amen. Same thing with Christ. We have to believe God said it, and that should settle it with us. And sometimes, sometimes, for whatever reason, something happens, and it stumps us a little bit. Pastor, who's this ever happened to? Guilty? Man, listen, I've been past 15 years. You don't think I've been stumped a few times? Oh, more than a few. Why? Because sometimes you just get challenged in these areas of your life. And you believe and you trust and all of a sudden something throws you a curve and you're going, man, your faith just gets kind of like, just like, you ever had a balloon and you go, take all the air out of it? What happens? Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to give you some things that I think are keys. These are keys that will help us to begin to find faith, okay? These are some keys that I want to help you with. Now, one of the keys that I want you to know that really helps us to find faith is when we, we learn the, now listen to this, we learn the fear of the Lord, okay? Now, for some of you right now, you're thinking, well, he hadn't given the spirit of fear, but a peace, power, and a sound mind. This is different, okay? When he's talking about the fear of the Lord here, he's talking about the reverence. He's talking about the, the respect for God. You know, I, I had a question asked to me, and I, I probably shared it before, and I'll share it again. But somebody asked me one time, says, what is one of the number one things you taught your children growing up? And I had to stop for just a second. And I thought, well, one of the number one things I taught my kids growing up is the fear of the Lord. Why? Because you're not going to always be around. You know, sometimes the kids won't do anything because mom and daddy's there. Somebody's watching. But when they have the fear of the Lord, they don't do it because they know God's watching. And so we need to respect who God is. I, I will tell you this, and I say it in kind of a strange way, but, you know, homie don't play. Come on. You can't, you, can't, you can't play around with God, you know? Listen, you, the Bible says don't even take his name in vain. Now, many of us think that's just cursing, saying the, the curse word, and it is to a certain degree, but I believe we take God's name in vain when we call ourselves a Christian and we act like a devil. We're, we're, we're really playing around with God. We're saying, yeah, I'm a holy Christian, and on the other side of your mouth, you know, you, you're doing other things that are not correct, or you're living a life that's not correct. You're living a lie, you know? And so the fear of the Lord is so important for us for our faith. We need to understand what Psalms talks about in 34, verse 8. <clears throat> he says here, he said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I love that, that phrase. Yeah. Because, see, sometimes you just got to taste it though it is good. Yeah. I, look, I'm Cajun. I probably eat things you won't even step on. <laughs> but there are things in my life that I had to taste because they sure didn't look good. Yeah. But once I taste them, I'm going, Oh, give me some more. Yeah. Amen. Some of you think, oh, I ain't no mud bug, you know. My wife was like that when we first got married. She wasn't going to eat no crawfish. She was raised in East Texas. They used to use that for bait. Brother, I took her to a crawfish ball. Now, now, when we go eat crawfish, brother, I try to take her. My, I, I, I say, you need, to go, you need to go check on this and check on that because she peels them faster than me. She can eat more than I can, amen, and crawfish. That's because she got saved. <laughs> Saved and sanctified. Some of you say, I don't even know what that means. Look it up. Amen? But he says here, he says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And he goes on to say, Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear him. I like that. No want to those who fear him. He says, The young lion lacks and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Come. You children, listen to me. I will teach you what? The fear of the Lord. You know, we have to learn. This, this is a learning process. And here's the real kicker to this is with society, and I say this quite often, when one generation tolerates, another generation practices. Because if we tolerate certain things that we're trying to say, well, yeah, they're sin, but they're not really that bad. 
Well, I promise you, your kids, you're teaching them that it's okay. You're teaching them tolerance in a lot of those areas that are not right. And we got to be careful. And so this is one of the areas. He says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Okay? Now, Proverbs, again, this is his son David. David I mean, David speaks and his son Solomon speaking in Proverbs. He says, give instructions to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, your days will be multiplied and the years of life will be added to you. Now, this is a great lesson to learn because the fear of the Lord will add time to your life. It will extend your days. Because, see, when you don't fear the Lord, you do some things that are really stupid that could take you out. I mean, you know, you might say, well, I, I fear the cops. I don't fear God. And you're going to drive 500 miles an hour down 171. And you wonder why you, you get killed. Come on. Because you didn't have the fear of the Lord, really. You thought you was, you know, invincible. Now, again, he talks about in Proverbs 19, 23, he says, The fear of the Lord, what, leads to life. And he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited by, with evil. I love that. Now, Acts talks about it again in 931. He says, talking about the church here. And he's talking about the fear of the Lord in the church. He says, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, Samar, and Leesville had peace and was edified. Amen. And working in the fear of the Lord, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Yeah. Now, when a church has the fear of the Lord, guess what it does? Not only one person, it's a multiplication takes place. Because whenever people say, listen, I, I respect God too much. And the church begins to say, you know what, God, you know, if you're visiting with us, we're so happy you came our way. And if you've been here just a few times, you've probably seen this before. But listen, when, when I go from that location to this location, during, between the transit there, man, I'm, I want to hear from God. And, and I'm going to be honest with you today. If, if the Spirit of the Lord speaks and says, we're just going to do something else, I'm going to go in that direction. Amen. Well, people will get mad and leave. <laughs> listen, you can only get mad at me. I fear God who can destroy body and soul. And see, we need to understand that when we flow in with the Holy Spirit, we need to let God be God in our life. Because many times we think we know more than God knows. And that's when we get in the way. You see, the fear of the Lord is going, God, you know better. I mean, it's like a while ago when I just stopped and I was, I was praying. And, and as we were going between, and God's like, there's people here today that just need to get their heart right. Some things going on, they just let, let go because if they don't, they won't hear the rest of the service. So I did it in the beginning. Why? Because I want to be led by the Holy Spirit. I want to be led by God. Look, if you wasn't here Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you something, and I hope this don't offend you, but you missed out on something good. Amen. Wednesday night, man, we had a freedom in here. And, and, and I'm not saying we hadn't had it before and won't have it again. We will. We'll let it go. But Wednesday night, man, something took place. I mean, there was a freedom that took place. My wife had to stay home that night because she was doing something. And she said, it happened because I wasn't there, right? <laughs> but we had, I mean, it was just a freedom. I mean, Mike, you were there. Wasn't it just a freedom in the Holy Spirit just flowing? And, I mean, we didn't want to rush it. I mean, I didn't want to rush it. I just wanted to kind of like just bask in it for a while. I mean, there was a sweet presence, and, man, things were happening. And, and look, everybody was worshiping. You know why? Because we fear God too much to get in his way. It's when we get in his way is when we mess it all up. It's the fear of the Lord, the respect of who he is. Now, here's the next thing. We're talking about keys to help us find our faith. Some things can't be found unless we ask. Now, we know this scripture, we've read this scripture, but you know what? Sometimes I think God just wants us to ask. Now, the scripture says he already knows what we need before we ask, but I think he, his joy in us asking because asking is really activating our faith. Because when we have to ask somebody something, we have to activate the fact that we believe that when we ask, we're going to receive. Now, many times we ask things and we receive it and we get surprised. Like... I can't believe that. Well, did you just ask that? Well, yeah. Well, there you go. Here's, here's your sign, you know. <laughs> Psalms talks about it in 2.8. He says, ask of me, and I will give you the nations. I love that for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possessions. Now, Matthew, this is a great scripture here that many of us <coughs> over, the <coughs> over the years have read many times. Matthew 7.7, 7, it says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks does what? Receives. And he who seeks does what? Fine. To him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you whom, if the son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? 
If you then, being evil, talking about us earthly fathers, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Listen, we need to knock and expect it to be open. We need to ask with faith and believe we're going to receive it. God says it again in Matthew. He talks about it again in Matthew 18, 19. He says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst. And that's a promise from God. Matthew 21, 21 says this. So Jesus answered and said to them, surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and cast in the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you'll receive. John 6, but again, 14, 12. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater, and greater. Look at your neighbors, like greater. Greater works that these who will do because I go to my Father. Now, he's going to the Father preparing something for us so we can do better works than he ever did. And whoever you, it says, and whatever you ask in my name that I will do for the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Now, what's the next one? Okay, I want to I jump over. I want to jump over to James because I want you to see this one real quick. James 4, verse 2. There's a couple more, but it says, Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Now, some of you remember this and... and, and it's kind of hard to even talk about because a lot of people got caught up with it, and some of the some of the things they were saying were, were doctrinal truth, but they kind of got perverted with it. That's a better way of saying it. Yeah, and it was called. It was in a charismatic movement. It was a name and claim it. I mean, everybody was name and claim it, name and claim it, name and claim it. And there were people laying hands on Cadillacs, going, "Oh God, you gonna give me this Cadillac?" And they wasn't receiving anything. Now here here's the difference. Okay, when you begin to ask something to glorify God then God will surely do it. Come on, somebody. But what's happening is we're asking for our own pleasures. Now, I use Cadillac as a sign. I'll go and lay hands on Cadillac. You know, I'm not saying that God won't give you a Cadillac. I'm not saying that. But here's, here's, uh, Stephen called me the other day. And Stephen's been real instrumental in bringing people to church. And he called me the other day and he says, he said, Pastor, it would be great if we had a van because if we had a van, I could bring more people. Now, what is the difference there? What's the difference? We're praying for a van to glorify God. You're praying for a Cadillac so your neighbors get jealous. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. And so we need to understand when we ask God, we need to know that whatever we ask him, it's going to bring glory to him. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and I'm going to stick my neck. I want to say this. I think sometimes things happen, miracles happen, when God gets all the glory. Because sometimes things won't happen because we will take all the credit. And it, it's, 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 and I'm going to deal with that just in a minute. I'll tell you what, let me keep moving on here. Talking about finding faith. Here's the next thing I want to talk about. Sometimes we look for faith and find, we, we, this is what we do. Let me just kind of go here. We settle for Ishmael and not Isaac. We're praying for Isaac, but we settle for Ishmael. What, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, Abraham who was given the nations, who God was with him, seen amazing things, God promised Abraham a son. Did he not? We call him the, prom- the, son- the promised son, which is Isaac. But Abraham decided with Sarah, him and Sarah got together, and Sarah says, well, you know, maybe God wants us to use, you know, my maidservant. You know, I, I can't give you a child, so maybe, you know, maybe you'll sleep with my, my maidservant, and-, and she'll give you a child. Well, we're going to help God out. And so Abraham does that, and Isaac comes along. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm not going to develop this. But a lot of the mess that we're dealing with in the East comes from this right here. comes from Ishmael. Because go back and read the Scriptures, how he's going to do all these things and stuff will happen. Listen, this was not the promised child. Isaac was the promised child. See, many times we pray. Look, I say this quite often. Good is an enemy to best. Because when we're praying for an Isaac, don't settle for an Ishmael. 
Now, let me talk to some young ladies here today. Listen, all your life, you've been praying for an Isaac for your life. Don't settle for Ishmael. Guys, listen, you've been praying for an Isaac. I'm not talking about... No, let's <laughs> rephrase that. We've been praying for a promise. Uh, uh, what's a good... Isabella. Isabella, thank you. <laughs> and you settle. Okay? L- let me tell you something. Young men and young women, you make decisions about buying a car or purchasing a computer. You put more thought into it than you do in a marriage. Because what happens, your hormones kick in. You lose all the blood in your head. Come on. I'm talking to adults here. But I'm telling you that God is willing to give you the promise. Don't settle for second best. Don't settle for something that ain't God. Good and God is two different things. The difference between good and God is that one, oh, come on, somebody. you got to believe that when you're praying for something, don't settle. But see, that's where faith gets wavered at. Because all of a sudden, it don't happen the way we think it should happen. It don't happen the way that, you know, in the timing or whatever the case may be. And so we get ahead of God. See, faith is waiting. Look, when you plant a seed, don't expect it. This thing, what is this, the story of the beanstalk? When he planted a seed, it shot up. Jack and the beanstalk. Look, not all seed. That's, that's a fairy tale. When you plant a seed, there's a waiting period before the harvest ever comes. But see, we plant and expect tomorrow to have the harvest. It's planting, waiting, tending, watering. Then the harvest comes. The same thing with, with, with our faith and our prayer. Sometimes we just got to trust God. God, I'm going to believe you. I'm going to trust you. No, come hell or high water. I'm not going to do anything but what you want me to do, God. Listen, we got to get ahead. Look, we got to say, you know, our faith, let our faith rise up. It's time to, that believers just let their faith rise up and start believing for the things God said he would do. We need to start trusting God in these areas of our life. You know, if we're not careful, and, and, I, and, and I experienced this in my life, there was a time in my life where my faith was in my pocket. Come on. I made enough money. If I got in trouble, I could bail myself out. But see, sometimes that will get you in trouble too. See, our faith needs to be in Christ alone. In Christ alone, we stand. Listen, I want to be on the rock, not some shifty sand. We have to stand by faith and believe, God, you said it. You said, look, even whenever the Old Testament, when they send the the worshipers ahead, you know, the the king was back there going, "God, God, you said, God, you said, God, you said, God, you promised, God, you said. Listen, I've been there before. I know I tell the story about I was in Russia and this guy from the mafia came and it's a long story and I won't give you all the details to it. It's kind of long. But I remember walking and he's facing me and all of a sudden I'm praying that prayer. I'm going, God, you said, God, you promised. And boy, he stopped me and he says, and to my friend, you know, he said, and to my duke. And I said, yeah, you know, I shook his hand. Drew, and it was, what, what am I saying there? Listen, sometimes we got to say, God, you told me to come. God, you said you would take care of us. God, you said you would never leave us or forsake us. God, you start rambling off the promises. What, what does promises do? Faith comes by what? Hearing? you got to hear some of those promises. And look, when things happen in your life and God comes through, start claiming those things too. You get sick, we get sick. God, you touch Julia. God, you can touch me. God, you touch, you can do me. Why? You've got to believe, man. It's time that we stand up and believe God said it, and that settles it for us. You know whether or not you believe it or not to make it true or not? You, you don't have the, char- the, the authority for that. Here's the next thing. Some things we find, or sometimes we find our faith in a test. Now, the only way you're going to get a testimony is you've got to walk through a test. Okay? They always say, you know, you won't have a message unless you have to clean up a mess, so to speak. Now, Daniel was, was there in Daniel 1.12. He says, please test your service for 10 days. Daniel was talking about testing them, and he won victory there. Second Corinthians, we find Paul here in, in 5, 13, 5. He says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, he says. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? In other words, t- do you not know that God's alive in you? That's what he's saying. Look, don't you know that the God who spoke this thing, don't you know that the one who created, don't you know the one who split the seas, don't you know he's in you? That's what he's saying. He says, unless indeed you are disqualified, but I trust that you will know that 
We are not disqualified. Yeah. I don't want to be disqualified. And I know good and well. Listen. Before I leave here today and I'll make my way to my house, I'll be tested. I'll be tested. I see it all the time. Listen, you can't stand for something and the devil won't test you on it. Look, when young believers stand up and they testify how God, you know, changed their life in certain areas, they quit doing this or do whatever, man, the minute they say it, man, all of a sudden I'm excited, but in another breath I'm over there trying to catch them. Because I go over and I say, look, I want to warn you. Now that you give God all the glory about things you're going through, you're going to be tested. And they will be tested. What does James talk about testing? He says, Count it a joy when you go through trials and tribulations. Why? No, it is hard. Matter of fact, look, there have been times in my life that that scripture popped up when I'm going through something, and I want to take a mark slot and just mark it out. <laughs> Thinking, well, if it's not in there, I don't have to deal with it. But it's there. Listen, you're going to be tested. God's looking for the faithful men. God's looking for faithful women that can pass the test that can get on the other side of the test listen sometimes God will ask you to do something just to see if you would are you willing to do it sometimes he don't want you to do it at all he just wants to see if you're willing to do it because maybe something you said challenged you in that test now can I share this with you you think You really think some things happen by accident? There's no accidents in the kingdom of God. Look, we serve a God who never says, oops. There's no accident with God. Anything, look, God knows before you even deal. God says, look, he knows our thoughts before we even think them. That's the God. God is omnipotent. God is everywhere. He knows all things. He knows you're going to walk through these tests. But guess what he says? He will never give you anything you can't handle. He himself went through things and and without sin, he says. Listen, we need to understand that when things come our way, we just need to go, okay, it's just a test. In the next 60 seconds, you're going to, you know, a little broadcast it. That's what we need to face and say, you know what? This is just a test. God's going to get me through this to the other side. We need to understand that these tests that will come our way. One of them says, talking about tested by fire. Now, here's the last thing this morning. And this is what I want to deal with, the last part of it here. We're talking about finding our faith. We find pure faith comes only from the heart. Pure faith comes only from from the heart. And I will say this before I get the rest of this stuff here. Maybe some of us today need a good heart transplant. Because now I know the scripture talks about, you know, out of the heart, the evil, deceitful, and all these things. I know that. But I'm telling you today that the purity of your faith comes from down in your soul, down in your heart, deep down inside. Because see, if you confess your sins and it's just a bunch of head knowledge, we used to talk about missing heaven by 9 or 13 inches, wherever the difference is between the two, because we don't have a heart knowledge. Listen, there is a heart transfusion that has to take place. Because, see, whether you know this or not, when I was being tested for my blood, I have JC positive. Come on, somebody. Y'all missed it right there. I have JC positive blood. I've got Jesus Christ blood running through my veins. Why? Because that's his heart. I gave him my heart. He took my old positive, whatever they may be out of there, and he put JC positive inside of me. I've got the blood of my father. I've got the blood of my daddy running through my veins. See, we need to have that heart transfusion, that the blood that runs through our veins... Listen, it has a purity about our faith. Let me read a couple of scriptures here. Psalms 86, 11. Again, he says, teach me your ways, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, 
with all my legs. I will glorify, no, all my heart. I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the pits, from the depths of hell. He's brought us out. Matthew says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Hebrews talks about in 1022. He said, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Romans talks about it again, 10.8. But what does he say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe where? In your heart that God has risen him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confesses, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew, Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Verse 13. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the hope that we have. It's a heart transfusion. Look. We have enough head knowledge. And the scary thing today is society, we're, we're, we're smarter than ever before. We have technology like never before. We're, we're just we're smarter than anything else. We need to have a heartfelt conviction with our faith. I'm not going to develop this, but I'm going to ask you to do something in just a moment. And I'm not trying to trick you. But I heard this this week, and I just want to share it with you. I'm not going to get into all the details of it. If you've got a cell phone, who's got a cell phone? Tell, pull your cell phone out. Just pull your cell phone. If you've got a cell phone, pull it out. If you don't mind, just pull your cell phone out. Just hold it in your hand. I'll say we got cell phones. You know, probably 90% of the world has cell phones today. Do you realize that the first time... In years, well, first of all, the technology you have in a smartphone is more than they had to land Apollo on the moon. That'll blow your mind right there. But here's what he said, and it really stretched me. He had people hold up their cell phones, and he says, you know, for the first time in years, there goes the cell phone. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus on the hotline, let him in, amen. But he said, for the first time in, in, in many years, because of our smartphones, because of our cell phones, we can watch something live happening clear across the globe. Something can happen in, well, look what happened just with, with the war. Man, we've seen it on CNN while it was happening. But with cell phones today, we're literally, as an individual, we can watch anything across the globe with a cell phone. This is what he said. He said, for the first time, the scripture really comes to life. In Revelations chapter 1, verse 7, it's talking about Christ coming in the clouds and all these things. But he says, every eye will see. Now, for years you read that and you just can't even imagine how everybody at one time could see something going on. But today we have the technology that every eye will see. And he said this, and it really kind of, it was kind of funny the way he said it. He said, it's kind of ironic they call it an iPhone. And I thought, wow, that is kind of interesting. But I'm telling you this today, we better have faith. Our faith better be stronger today than ever before because you will be challenged. Now, I'm not one of these guys that I'm trying to, you know, do something. I'm not a big end-time preacher. I, I wish I, I was knowledgeable enough to understand. A lot. I don't understand a lot of that. There's guys who are over my head when they start talking about all this stuff because God gave me the vision and, and the ministry to reach the people that are lost today. And But I'm telling you today that our faith better be real because when it's tested, and listen, some of us 
unfortunately, might fail that test. But our faith better be strong enough today. We better have the keys to our faith to unlock anything the devil throws at us. Because he will. He will. Let's bow our heads. I want to pray for a couple of things. The first thing is this. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, the message you preached about finding faith, several things you said or one thing you said, and I could go through the list, I'm not, but something you said really, really pulled the strings of my heart. And I realized that that's me. That's me. Maybe it's the fear of the Lord. Maybe it's, you know, you, you settle in for an Ishmael instead of an Isaac. It doesn't matter. But the question is this, is I want to have faith with you that whatever you stand in need of, God's going to give it to you. Now, you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm being challenged in this area of my life. Pray for me. I'm not going to embarrass you again. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to stand. None of these things. I just want to mix my faith with your faith and come in agreement. But you're here today and you say, Pastor... One of these things really pulled at the string of my heart. Would you pray for me? Just raise your hand right where you're at. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? I want to miss an opportunity. Hands all over. Thank you, Jesus. Father, as I mix my faith with brothers and sisters all across this room, God, you know what they stand in need of that I don't. And God, you're able to equip God, you're able to complete anything that's lacking in our life that we can have stronger faith. God, maybe today we showed up and realized that we had put our faith on the shelf or we lost our faith or just misplaced our faith. God, let us find faith. Let us find it today stronger than ever before. Let us realize 